Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday, Samuel, the Chronicle study. We're in 1 Kings chapter 13. We'll be starting with verse 11. Let's have a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for the stories that you have recorded for us that help us understand how you deal with people and how people respond to you so that we might respond properly, Father, in order to bring you honor and glory. We're so thankful that you're our God. We're so thankful that you created us and made us and we just pray, Father, that we might give to you, to your Son, and to your Holy Spirit, uh, all the honor and the glory that you deserve. We pray as we study that you would help us to apply the things that we've learned, and that your Holy Spirit would be here to help us so that we might uh, uh, know better how to serve you and glorify you. We thank you for everybody who's present today, and we pray that you bless them. And Father, we ask a special a blessing on all those people who are ill and sick and not feeling well, and not just in our congregation, but Throughout the entire world, Father, we know that you have a way of taking care of them and, and providing for them no matter what happens. And so we pray that you would be gracious and merciful, especially to those, Father, who have not come to know you, that you would give them opportunity and a chance to get to know you uh, before it's too late. We thank you for every blessing, and we ask that you forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to remind you again of just a couple of charts that we always look at. And that is that when you look at 1 Kings, we're looking at a chart that deals with basically the, the reign of the United Kingdom and then the rule of, of, uh, of the divided kingdom. We're in chapter 13 today, so we covered the division that happened in chapter 12, where, where we went from Solomon to Jeroboam, his son. And who, who rules in the, uh, I'm sorry, to Rehoboam, his son, who rules in the, in the northern kingdom? Jeroboam. Okay, so Jeroboam rules in the northern kingdom, and that's where we're at now. And, and we're we're looking at what at what Jeroboam did in order for him to to try to preserve his kingdom, or at least according to the way he thinks he ought to do it. Uh, and then uh, notice that in Second Chronicles we have some of the same material that we have in First Kings and Second Kings. And we're going to be looking at at Second Chronicles a little bit more as we get into our study with these various kings, because we're going to notice that a number of the kings uh, have more information given to us in, in Second Chronicles than we do in the Book of Kings. Those places that are about the same will stay in the Book of Kings. And then also remember the chart that I have up there on the overhead for you, and that's here for those of you that are watching this online. That's here, uh, and it's the chart of the kings. Remember that we covered the United Kingdom period uh, up there would be Right there's the United Kingdom period. You had Saul, Solomon, and uh, David and Solomon. Right here, the kingdom's divided. Remember that these up here are the kings of Israel, and these down here in the bottom are the kings of Judah. And remember that all those little names that are in there either are kings that get inserted into those slots, or they are the names of prophets. And those that are in squares, in solid squares, are what we call oral prophets. And those that are in like dotted squares, like here, are what we call literary prophets. Those are the ones who actually have books in the Bible that we look at. For example, this is Obadiah and Joel, and they are uh, what we call literary prophets because they wrote books. Uh, it doesn't mean that they were more important than the other ones, but God preserved their writings for some reason, whereas opposed to the other ones, we just have them mentioned throughout history. So we're looking here as we're looking at Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the king of the, of the south, and Jeroboam is the king of the north. Jeroboam is over Israel, and Rehoboam is over uh, Judah. And so as we're looking at this, we're looking at, at a rather interesting story here that we looked at about a prophet. And this prophet came to, uh, came to uh, Jeroboam because as Jeroboam was given the northern kingdom, he, he thought he had a problem. And what's the problem that he thought he had? All right. So his problem was that he thought if if he uh, if he didn't do something and the people went back to the temple in order to worship and in order to to go to the feast that they would abandon him and he would no longer be be king and that he would end up dying. And so in order to preserve himself, uh, he then set up something. What did he set up? All right. He made up two places of worship in Dan and Bethel. And in those two places, he also put in priests that weren't from the Levites. But he said that, that, that the calf that they were worshiping was the God who led them out of, out of Egypt. So he wasn't necessarily taking them away from, 
from following Jehovah. He just corrupted the worship of Jehovah. Uh, and, and therefore, they were doing things that God never said they should do. But it was a corruption as they were, uh, as they were along with the other gods that they would serve, would in some way worship Jehovah. And so what we had then was we had this prophet that came. And this prophet came to them and in, in, uh, came to Jeroboam in chapter 13. Uh, and it doesn't give us a name. It just says he was a prophet. And he came and basically, what did he, what did he tell uh, Jeroboam? As Jeroboam was offering on one of these um, um, altars, the, these fake altars that they had to, to the golden calf, what was it that this prophet basically told him? All right. By, by a guy named Josiah, right? That Josiah was going was gonna to be the one who was going to come, and he, and he was going to do something on that altar. What was he going to do? Well, he's going to crush it, but he would sacrifice the bones of the priests on it, so he would defile it, right? Uh, and then uh, what did Jeroboam do when he heard that? All right, he stretched out his hand, and what happened to his hand? It withered, right? And, and he couldn't move it. So uh, what, did the, what did the prophet do to prove that his message was from God at that time? Well, he healed his hand, but something before that. The, the, the altar was, was broken, right? Was split. And then he healed um, Jeroboam's uh, uh, hand or arm. And then Jeroboam invited him to stay uh, and eat. And Jeroboam would give him a reward. And what did the prophet say? He couldn't. He wasn't allowed to do that. And so that's where, that's where we find him here in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 10. And we basically find a rather interesting little story here uh, that we're going to continue reading in 1 Kings 13 and verse 11. It says, now an old prophet was living in Bethlehem, and his son came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day in Bethel. And the words which he had spoken to the king, these also they related to their father. Their father said to them, which way did he go? Now his sons had seen the way which the man of God who came from Judah, had gone. Then he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode away on it. So he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. He said, I cannot return with you nor go with you nor will I eat bread, bread or drink water with you in this place. For, for a command came to me by the word of the Lord, you shall eat no bread nor drink water there. Do not, return by, uh, do not return by going the way which you came. And he said to him, I also am a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went, with, he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it came about as they were sitting down at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah saying, thus says the Lord God, because you have disobeyed the command of the Lord, and have not observed the command which the Lord your God commanded you, but have returned and eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the grave of your fathers. It came about after, uh, it came about after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him for the prophet whom he had brought back. Now, when he had gone, a, a lion met him on the way and killed him, and his body was thrown on the road with the donkey standing beside it and the lion also standing beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown on the road and the lion standing beside the body. So they came and told it, told it in the city where the old prophet lived. Now, when the prophet who brought him back from the way 
heard it. He said, it is the man of God who disobeyed the command of the commandment of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. Then he spoke to his son, saying, saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. He went and found the bo his body thrown on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body nor torn the donkey. So the prophet took up the body of the man of God and set and laid it on the donkey and brought it back. And he came to the city of the old prophet to mourn and to, to bury him. He laid his body in his own grave and they mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. After he had buried him, he spoke to his son saying, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried lay my bones beside his bones for the thing shall surely come to pass which he cried by the word of the lord against the altar in bethel and against all the houses of the high of the high places which are in the cities of samaria after this event event jeroboam did not return from his evil ways but again he made priests of the high places for from among all the people any who who would he ordained to be priests of the high places this uh, event became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it from off the face of the earth. And so you have this rather interesting situation that happens here as a result of this prophet. When this young prophet had been asked by, by Jeroboam, come and eat with me, the young prophet said, no, uh, I'm not supposed to. I have a command of God. I'm not supposed to do that. But then you have this other story in here about this other old prophet and he says he lied to him. And you kind, of, you kind of wonder, well, why in the world did this happen? What, you know, why? What's it about? And, and it seems rather unfair, doesn't it? it? It seems rather unfair that you have this guy who comes and says he's a prophet. And he tells this other prophet that he had a vision from the Lord. And therefore, the individual went against what God had commanded him to do because he thought, this new prophet had new orders, and therefore he was going to follow him. But I want you to understand that there's a lot of principle in there that we need to understand. Uh, first of all, I want you to go with me to, to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And in Deuteronomy chapter 18, one of the subjects under consideration is how in the world are, are we going to, going to get in touch with the spiritual world? That's really what Deuteronomy 18 is about. Uh, how are we supposed to do that? The world does it through psychics, mediums, spirit, spiritless Ouija boards, all those kind of things. That's the way they think that they can get in touch with the spirit world. But God is telling his people how it is that they're going to get in touch with the spirit world. And so he says down here, uh, beginning at verse, uh, at verse 15, Deuteronomy 18, 15, he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among, your bre from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. So God says, I'm going to send you a prophet. You don't have to have seances. You don't have to have Ouija boards. You don't have to have tarot cards. You don't have, you, you're not going to use any of that. I'm going to send you a prophet. I will let you know, God says. I will tell you. And he says in verse 16, this is, this is, uh, this is according to all that you asked of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire anymore, or I will die. God says, the reason I'm doing this for you is because when I appeared to you on, on the mountain over here, where you received the law, when you came out of Egypt and you received the law here, I was up on the mountain and all this smoke and lightning and thunder, and you guys got scared. And so God says, so I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't want to scare you and terrify you. So I'm going to do what you told me to do. And that is you wanted somebody to be a, a mediator between uh, you and God. And so God calls that a prophet. That's what a prophet is. A prophet is really somebody who goes between God and people in order to tell people what God wants. And so that's what he told. That's what he said, that he's, he's going to raise up this prophet. Uh, and he says in verse 17, the Lord said to me, uh, it, this is Deuteronomy 18, 17, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their own, their countrymen like you. And so when he says that to, to Moses, he's talking about the fact that Moses got to see God face to face. And of course, this is a reference to Jesus. He says, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. 
it shall come about that whoever uh, will not listen uh, to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So God says, when this prophet comes, you better listen to him, because if you don't, then God's going to require that of your hands. Now, verse 20, he says, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall surely die. Now, notice that when he says this in verse 20, he's not talking about the prophet who's coming, but he's talking about other prophets. So they were going to have prophets beside the prophet. God was going to send them prophets. During this time, God sent them Elijah. Well, you can see some of the prophets up here on our chart that God sent to them. There's Shemai, uh, Ahijah, uh, Elijah, Elisha. And so these are the prophets that God was sending them before the prophet would come. Uh, and and uh, he says, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing come to pass, uh, if the thing come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord, ha uh, the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And so he points out, he points out basically that when a prophet comes, that that prophet is going to be able to tell you uh, uh, and, and you'll be able to know. So God says there's going to be a way that you'll know the prophet. And he says that's because the thing will come to pass. Now, in Deuteronomy 13, turn to Deuteronomy 13 with me. And verse 1 says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods and let us serve them. You shall not listen to, to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And so he also says that not only am I going to send you prophets that you're going to be able to test, they're going to give you a sign, but he says uh, there's also going to be false prophets that are going to come, and it's going to look like, going to look like they are real prophets. But the problem is, is the message they give you. The message they give you is the is the is the uh, uh, answer to whether they're really prophets of God or not, okay? You remember when Moses was uh, delivering the children, the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he turned his rod into a snake? What, what did the, the priests of Pharaoh do? They also threw down a rod, and it became a snake, right? So it looks like they have power. looks like they're from God, but the problem was they weren't listening to God or doing what God said, then Moses brought, of course, eight bears, but uh, there, there's two ways that, that, you, that God gives you to be able to know whether a prophet is from God or not. One is, does he give you a sign to prove that he's from God? Does he do something to prove he's from God? That's the first thing. The second thing is, maybe he does a sign that looks like it, kind of like Simon the Sorcerer in Acts 8. Remember Simon the Sorcerer? They all thought that he was a, 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 the voice of God because he was doing all these magic things they couldn't figure out, right? So it looked like he was a prophet, but his message wasn't from God. So there's two ways that you can tell whether you should listen to somebody. Number one, if they say they're from God, they need to give you a sign. They, they, they need to give you something that you realize and know is, is only possible because God does it. And the, and the other thing is you need to check their message. That's what you need to check. Now, that's not just true for you guys. That's true for me, too. It's not just true for the people of Israel. It's also true for the prophets. The prophets also are under the same requirements and under the same rules that you and I are. The prophets don't have different rules and different, and different regulations than we do. They have exactly the same ones. And so this young prophet, when God said to him, you know, don't eat there and, and, and don't stay there and go back a different way. 
when, when the young prophet had got that command from God and he was positive that that command was from God, the very first thing that he should have done when this old prophet said, I'm a prophet from God and God appeared to me, the first thing he should have done was what? Give me a sign. How do I know that what you're telling me is actually from God? How do I know that? Now, did the old prophet give him a sign? No. He just said something to him. Now, what's the second way you know? The message. Well, what's the message that the old prophet said? It was different than the message that God had told him. It was different. God said, don't go eat. This guy said, God says you can't. Now, you might say, yeah, but he tricked him. It doesn't matter whether he tricked him or not. You, 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 know the, you know the old expression, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? We, we're supposed to learn. This is a prophet. He's supposed to know these things. You're not supposed to just follow, follow uh, uh, this individual, okay? Now, that also helps us understand over here in Galatians chapter 1, where God is talking to us about the gospel. And this is what he says. Uh, uh, he says down here, beginning at verse one, uh, verse six, sorry, Galatians 1, 6. I'm, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, who did the, who did the old prophet say appeared to him? An angel from heaven. He says, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a, a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. So here, which one of these two is Paul saying is going to indicate for you whether it's true or not? Which one of these two ways? The message. What's the message that, these, that this supposed angel is teaching you? If this angel is teaching you a different message than, you've been, than, than Paul says that I have taught you or the, other, or the other apostles have taught you, then you're not supposed to listen to it. It, does, it doesn't matter if he was an angel. You're not supposed to listen to him because Satan turns his, his servants into angels of light. And so there was a way for this prophet to know that he shouldn't be doing what this old prophet said, said for him to do. There was ways that God could verify it and God could tell him, but he never asked God. He, he never went to God in prayer and said, God, did you send this prophet to me? Uh, he, he never asked the prophet for, for a sign. He, he, he just simply went along with it. And it could be, maybe he was hungry. And he figured, you know, I'm hungry. Maybe the Lord knows I'm hungry. And so since I'm hungry, God sent me this prophet. So I go find a place to eat. And so I'm going to go eat. And maybe that's what he thought. I don't know. But the fact is that he didn't do what God said. And maybe that's the reason why we don't have this prophet's name. We don't have this prophet's name. We have some of the other prophets who didn't do as marvelous deeds as this guy did, but we don't have this prophet's name. Now, what does that have to do with us? Well, today, there are, there are people today, there are major religions today that base their fo founders on visions that they say that, th that their founders saw, the Mormons. They say that, that uh, Joseph Smith saw, saw the angel Moroni, do we have any, was there any witnesses when that happened? No. He says he found some, some uh, uh, golden tablets. Any of the golden tablets around? No. Now, there were some witnesses, there were seven of them, who said they saw the golden tablets. Before they died, five of them said we lied. Five of them basically felt so guilty about it that they said that, that they never did see them. They just made it up. Uh, and so that, there's no evidence for that. The, the, the uh, uh, well, not the other witnesses, the uh, Quran. Uh, the, the Quran was seen by, by uh, an angel, okay? The, the angel so, supposedly delivered the Quran to, to somebody and they, saw, and, and they got it and they wrote it. Uh, 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 Muhammad, the prophet, okay? And he, he basically saw this angel. Well, what's the problem with that? There you go. If an angel comes to you and teaches something different, then what? Don't then don't believe him. Okay. So what if somebody comes up to you today and says, hey, I got a message from God and he wants you to do this. What? Give me a sign. 
Let me know it's from God or else point me to the Bible. Point me to where the Bible tells me to do that. Because I've gone to people before and said, you know what? You can't shack up with that girl. Well, who do you think you are? Well, I'm nobody, but here's what the Bible says. Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what the Bible says. So it's not really me giving the message. It's me pointing the message to somebody else, right? So when somebody comes to you and says, I have a message from God for you, unless they can give you a sign, don't believe them. And if they can give you a sign and you know it goes against what God says, don't believe it and don't do it. And so it's not, it's not a terribly uh, tricky thing that God did here with this prophet. This prophet should have known. He's a prophet. He's supposed to know that there's false prophets running around out there. That's why, that's why God has his real prophets, because there are false prophets running around. And there's still false prophets running around today. There's still false prophets running around telling people today what, what they're supposed to do. Uh, and, and many churches have, have, uh, have prophets. Uh, and, and some churches even look at the idea of prophets as individuals who basically uh, aren't necessarily inspired by God, but they're kind of like me, a preacher. And they'll preach to you, and so that makes them a prophet. And from one standpoint, that's okay, but that's not the technical use of the word. The technical use of the word is you're inspired by God, and God fills you up, and God tells you exactly what to say. God puts in your, in your head the very words that you're supposed to say, just like when Aaron stood before Pharaoh, and he spoke the words that Moses put in his mouth to Pharaoh, and that's what a prophet is. And so as, so as you take a look at this story here, uh, we feel bad for the, for the, for the uh, young prophet. And I don't know if this implies, therefore, that the young prophet didn't get to heaven. I don't know. Reason I, the reason I don't know that is, yes, he was disobedient to God, but he certainly could have repented and asked God to forgive him before the lion killed him. He certainly could have done that, Okay. Uh, but but the other thing is that we're going we're gonna to hear about this, this prophet's grave later on. Something's going to happen with this prophet's grave, and when somebody throws some, somebody in here, that individual is going to come to life. And so, so the idea is that this prophet is connected even in his death with God. And so I, I, so I want you to, I want you to uh, understand that. So well, let's take a look now that I read the whole story for you. And, and let's kind of break it up and see if we can understand some things that, that may be helping us. First of all, this guy was an old prophet, right? But where was he living in verse 11? He was living in Bethel. Well, if he was a prophet of God, he's living in Bethel. What should he have been doing? He should have been telling Jeroboam, look, you can't do this. This is wrong. This isn't right. He should have been standing up. Maybe that's the reason why God had to send a younger prophet. Maybe this prophet got tired or old or, or you know, retired, maybe. I, I don't know, you know, but, but apparently he had his faculties because, you know, he was able to figure out what was going on here. Uh, and, and so this old prophet comes and his sons come and tell him the deeds of, of God that the, that the young prophet had done. And, and the father wants to know which way, which way he went. Uh, and he sends his sons to saddle his donkey in verse 13. And so he goes after him and he says to him in verse 14, so he went after the man of God and found him sitting under the oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. So uh, I think it's interesting that as he goes, he finds the, the, the man sitting under, the, uh, 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 under an oak. Uh, if God had told me to get out of a place, I wouldn't hang around. And so I don't know why he was sitting under this oak, but anyway, that, that's where he found him. Maybe, maybe it was siesta time. I don't know. He says, uh, uh, and he asked him, are you, the, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And, and he says, come home with me and eat. Now, no, notice that in verses 16 and 17, uh, the young prophet says, no, this is what God said to me. This is the exact message I have from God. I know this came from God. I'm not supposed to eat there. I'm not supposed to drink there. And I'm not supposed to return the same way. And so I know that's exactly what God said. If you ever study with Mormons, 
and, and you try to study with them. And if they and if they decide that you're kind of worthless to study with, the last thing that they'll tell you is they'll tell you that you need to pray to God. They'll give you their testimony. And their testimony is basically this. I prayed to God and God told me the Book of Mormon was true. And they'll tell you, you pray to God and ask God if the Book of Mormon is from God and God will tell you. What are you going to tell them? Okay. We don't need to pray to God. God has already given us the information. We know that, that the Book of Mormon isn't from God. I don't have to have a subjective, I don't have to have a, sub, a subjective feeling or a subjective verification because the problem with subject with subjective things is they come from me. That's why there's so many people today who claim that they can speak in tongues, who claim they can do miracles, who claim they can do these things, because it's all subjective. It's according to how they feel. And they've been told that unless you feel this way, that you're really not a true Christian. Unless you have this some kind of miraculous power, you're really not a true Christian. So if I want to be a, a, a true Christian and with all my heart and I'm sincere about it, what am I going to end up wanting to do? Have some kind of manifestation or some kind of sign. And, and my mind is going to do whatever I want it to do or whatever I'm expecting it to do. And that's why God never put our faith in subjective realities, because those really aren't real, but in objective realities. Everything that we put our faith in is outside of us. The Bible is outside of us. The miracles that were done were outside of people. The, the coming of Jesus was outside. The, the resurrection of Jesus was outside. The, the crucifixion of Jesus, it was all done in, in history. It wasn't something that was internal where you sit around going, oh yeah, I know I'm with God now, I can feel it. Okay, now we sing a song that says, uh, I, I know God lives because he lives within my heart. Well, that's really not a good way to know God lives. Unless you understand that he lives in our heart because the objective uh, uh, evidence has given me the faith in my heart, then that's okay. But I'm afraid a lot of people take that song and they mean, you know, God kind of talks to me and he tells me inside that he's real. And so therefore he's real because I feel it in my heart. Well, then what's the word of God for? What's the Bible for? What in the world do you need that for? That's right. It's subjective. And so, th so th that's, what I, that's what I want you to get uh, out of what he's talking about. He says to him in verse 14, uh, or, or I'm sorry, in verse uh, 18, uh, the, the old prophet then says, I also am a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So you might say, well, why didn't God stop him? Okay, but, but I'm not asking you why he lied to him. I'm asking you, why did God allow the prophet to lie? No, I, that's to test him. I want to know, why did God allow the prophet to lie? Because he wasn't a true prophet? Because God is not going to control what you say. God gives you the choice. If you want to lie, God's going to let you lie. If you want to steal, God's going to let you steal. If, if, if you want to uh, deny reality, God's going to let you deny reality. God is not going to control your life. And individuals who tell you that God's going to control your life, unless they mean it in a, you know, kind of a figurative way, that's not how God controls your life. How does God control your life? By faith. It's by faith. What does faith mean? Well, faith comes by hearing, but it means trust. You see, I will do what people whom I trust ask me to do because I trust them. That's right. And that's what faith is. Faith is trusting God. So when people say we came from evolution, I go, no, I don't trust you. I trust God. God says he created us. When they say that the world and the universe has been here for trillions and trillions of years, 
I, I go, no, God said it hasn't been here that long. I don't know how long it's been here, but God made it. And when they say, well, well, matter's been here forever and ever. No, God made it. Why? Because I trust God. Okay? That's what it is. You trust God. And, and this uh, old prophet said that he too was a prophet of God. And rather than the young prophet trusting what God said, he was trusting this older guy. Now, this is generally not the rule. But generally, older people who are godly people are people you can take advice from. But just because they're older doesn't mean that you follow them because they're older. You also need to make sure that what they're telling you comes from God. Okay. And so this prophet here said that he saw an angel and the angel said, come and eat bread with me. Uh, and so uh, verse 19 says, so he went back and, uh, with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. And so he did what he was commanded not to do, and he never asked God if he should go. Uh, and uh, do, you, do you remember right here when, when uh, Jacob uh, was uh, living during the time of the famine? Remember when Joseph went to Egypt and he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams? Remember? And Pharaoh had those, those two dreams about the, the cows and the corn, remember? seven years of plenty and seven years of drought, okay? And the seven years of plenty were going to come before the seven years of drought. Remember all that, right? Well, while, while all that was going on, Jacob was living in Canaan, right? And then when, it, when the drought came, they got hungry and they went over to Egypt, remember? And that's when they found their, uh, uh, that's when they found Joseph, remember? And Joseph said, go call dad and have him come over here. You remember the verse that's in there? That, that, tells you that God came down to, to Jacob and said, Jacob, you can go. Why did God tell him that? Well, yeah, but there's a reason why God came down and said, you can go. There's not a lot of places where God says, yeah, you can go. You want to go hunting? Yeah, you can go. You want to get married? Yeah, you can get married. There's not a lot of places where God said that, but he, he did here. How come he did it here? Because God had told Jacob, you stay in the land of Canaan. That's where I'm going to bless you. And so when his son Joseph said, come to Egypt, Jacob's going, I don't know if I should go. God didn't tell me I should go. And then all of a sudden, God says to, to Jacob, Jacob, you can go. Go down there. So unless you get a direct revelation from God to contradict something that God said you're not supposed to do, we do what God says, and, and, and that's what we need to understand, okay? So, so he did the very thing God told him to do, and he didn't check it with God. That was his problem. He didn't ask God. Now, verse 20 says, now it came about as they were sitting down at the table, this verse 20, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had uh, brought him back. Now, this is the old prophet. So, so God does use this old prophet, but he uses this old prophet in a rather interesting way he prophesies doom to the young prophet because the young prophet didn't listen to what god said and so it, so he says uh in verse 21 and he cried to the man of god who came from judah saying thus says the lord because you have disobeyed the command of the lord and you notice you disobeyed the command of the lord he thought he was obeying the command of the Lord, didn't he? Did, he? did he think he was obeying the command of the Lord, or was he doing this out of sheer rebellion? He, he thought he was doing what the Lord said. The problem was what? He trusted the man the Lord didn't say. So you and I aren't to trust people when it comes to our soul salvation. You can trust them when it comes to your money if you want, or, you know, buying a car or something if you want. But you don't trust him when it comes to your soul. That's why God doesn't want anybody between you and him. God doesn't want a church between you and him. God doesn't want elders between you and him. God doesn't want your wife between you and him. God doesn't want your husband between you and him. God wants 
to deal with you directly, not some society, not some system. God wants to deal directly with you. But you have to allow him to do that. Yes. Right. 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 Exactly. So. So. That's right. Yeah. So so that's the problem with Adam and Eve, right? A Adam and both Eve listen to somebody else instead of God. That's what they did. So we need to be careful about listening to somebody else instead of listening to God, right? Except for me, you can listen to me, right? You can, you can believe everything I tell you, right? What do you mean, no? That's right. The answer is the answer is no, because because I am a no body when it comes to what God wants us to do. We're just trying to figure out what God says. Okay. All right. So. Uh, uh, as a result of that, the, the old prophet said to the young prophet that, you know, you're going you're gonna to die because you, you didn't do what God says. Now, in verse 24, he says, now, when he, had, when he had gone, a lion met him on the way and killed him. And his body was, thr was thrown on the road with a donkey standing beside it. And the lion also was standing beside the body. So you got to see this miracle. Here's a lion that came and basically, you know, um, either knocked the man down or the donkey got afraid and kicked the, kicked the, the, the prophet off his donkey and the lion killed, killed the man. And then the lion just sits beside him and the donkey's beside him. So you have a donkey and a lion beside each other. How often does that happen? Uh, it doesn't happen, right? So, there, so, you know, as, I, as I'm reading this, I'm trying to think there, there has to be some kind of picture in this, right? There's, there's, two, there's three main characters in this little drama, you might say. There's God, there's the young man, and there's a prophet, right? Well, I think the young man is represented by the young man who's dead. Well, who would the lion represent? God. Who would the dumb donkey represent? The old prophet. The old prophet. I, think, I think that's what you got there. You got this picture of, of God doing what God's going to do, and the prophet can do nothing because he's like this dumb donkey that's there. The, 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 the lion could eat him up if he wanted, but the lion doesn't. The lion lets the prophet come, the old prophet come and pick the pick the the uh, corpse up and put it on top of the donkey and take him home. And, and so I think that's part of this picture that you have going on here. Yes. Well, the lines of representation of God or Jesus. Sure. Yeah. The, the one who's ruling, the one who has the right to rule and the power to, to, to yeah, of life and death, you might say in, in this story. And, and then you have that dumb donkey that's there. Right. Okay. And so basically he, he gets killed. Uh, and then it says in verse uh, 26, he says, now when the, when the prophet who, would, who, who brought him back from the, from the way heard of it, in other words, that he'd been dead, he said, it is the man of God who disobeyed the command of the Lord. Therefore, <coughs> the Lord has, has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And so basically he says he, he was a prophet of God. He really was. And if he didn't believe it before, he certainly believed it now. Now, uh, it says he went and found the body, okay, and basically brought it home. Uh, and when, when he brought it home, he buried it. And the old prophet mourned over him when he buried him. Now, in verse 30, it says he, uh, he laid his body in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, alas, my brother. Now, verse 31. And after he had buried him, he spoke to, the sons, to his son, saying, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried and lay my bones beside his bones. Now, somehow, 
the old prophet wanted to be in close proximity to God. And so he figured that the closest I'm going to get to God is by being buried next to this prophet. And so he wanted his bones buried next to, next to the prophet because somehow he had the idea that just by being close to somebody, you're going to be in a right relationship with God. And that's what he was looking for. And the Bible doesn't say that he was. Uh, and the Bible doesn't say that, that he did. Um, and so in, in verse 32, it says, For the thing shall surely come to pass, which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places, which are in the cities of Samaria. And so he says that what, what this prophet said, what, what uh, uh, Ahijah the prophet said there, uh, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't have his name, uh, the prophet that's right there, that prophet that's in there that we don't have his name, that, that prophet, whatever he says is going to come to pass, and that is that God's going to destroy the high places in Samaria. And that happened in 70 AD when the Roman Empire not only destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, but they also destroyed Samaria, and they took all those religious places that they had over there, and they tore those down. And so what the prophet said eventually came to pass, along with what Josiah was going to do, during Josiah's reign, he was going to burn uh, the bones of the priests on top of that altar. And so in verse 33, it says, after this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way. So did Jeroboam have, have enough evidence and, and proof that this prophet was from God? It was all typed, right? I mean, it wasn't like there was just one sign. There was all these different signs that he did. Not only that, but he had a personal sign, his arm. So when some people tell you, you know, if I could just see a miracle, I'd believe. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, Jeroboam even asked the prophet, pray to God. So God can do this, right? You're God, right? So when somebody tells you today that, you know, if I see a miracle, then I'll believe. No. Jeroboam saw lots of miracles, personal experiences, and yet he didn't believe. He didn't trust. Remember, that's what belief is. Belief is trust. And he was unwilling to trust. He says, after this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil ways, but again, he made priests of the high places from among all the people, and uh, uh, any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. So he says, anybody who would, he gave them uh, as priests, okay? In, uh, well, why, why would you want to be a priest? Okay, so, 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 so you get all your provisions, everything taken care of for you, don't you? Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. And verse 34. And this event became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it from off the face of the earth. And so that happens right here. When Israel, the 10 northern tribes, get carried off into Babylonian activity, uh, of captivity, Jeroboam's reign and dynasty end, comes to an end. David's dynasty, even though there's this 70-year gap, well, actually, there's this a uh, 600 year gap from the time they went off into Babylonian captivity to when Jesus comes over here and becomes king, even though there's that 600 year gap or 600 plus, God, God fulfilled his promise to David that he made in the United Kingdom, that David would have a, a descendant to sit on his throne who would rule forever and ever. And that was fulfilled in Jesus. Jeroboam's line ended, well, way before Israel fell, but it still ended when Israel fell and his line ended and yes the assyrians came in in uh, seven uh, 722 bc and, and destroyed the the uh nation of israel the 10 northern tribes all right so is there any question or anything anybody might might like to ask or say about that that story yep Right. 
-hmm. Right. Maybe, maybe the old prophet learned something. Maybe the old prophet repented before he died. You know, maybe he figured out that he shouldn't have done that. And that's the reason he was being respectful. Maybe. Anybody else have anything? <laughs> Did he just want company in his old age? Maybe. Or maybe he wanted company of another prophet. Who knows? But he lied. That's the point. You know, yes. Well, it's kind of like it's kind of like when the church has a meeting and everybody wants to invite the visiting preacher over to their house to eat. Right. That's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you have to remember that the, the priest uh, didn't have an, an inheritance. So their inheritance was basically from the goodwill of the people. Yeah. All right. So so anything then down that far? All right, let's see if we can't cover a couple of verses in chapter 14 as we get in here. Uh, we'll just cover a few of these. It says, at that time of Abijah, the son of Jeroboam became sick. And, and so you have Abijah, who is the son of Jeroboam. Remember, this is Jeroboam. So we're talking about his son. So he has a son, and his son's name is Abijah. And he became sick. And so it says, Jeroboam said to his wife, arise now and disguise yourself so that they will not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh, and behold, Ahijah the prophet is there, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over the people, and take ten loaves with you, some cake, and a jar of honey, and go to him, he will tell you what will happen to the boy. Now, here's what I, here's what I want you to notice. Here's Jeroboam. Jeroboam has been living comfortably and happily under his false system of worship. He's been living under it happily. Why in the world, when his son gets sick, does he not talk to one of his priests? Okay, so they're not from the tribe of Levi? They weren't real priests. It wasn't real religion. Here's what I want, here's what I under, what I want you to understand. Well, let me ask you this. Why all of a sudden does he want to go then to Judah? Why do you want to go to this prophet? Maybe he doesn't know what to do? Oh, maybe he knows it's the truth. Here's what I, here's, here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to understand. Religion is not meant for when you're alive. Don't misunderstand that. Yes, we do stuff religiously because we're alive. But that's not why we do religion. That's not why we serve God. We serve God because we're going to die. We serve God because, because we're going to die. A lot of people follow are, are happy to live with religions as long as they're alive but when it comes to death then they have to find something different and what you need to understand is that there's a lot of religions out there that will happily let you live any way you want to and you can be happy about the way you live and think you're okay with god but it's not going to help you in death and so when when uh, uh, Jeroboam's son was sick and they were afraid he was going to die, their pleasurable, fake, false human religion was not going to go beyond the grave. But he also knew that he had too much of a faith No, that was the nameless prophet. This is, a, this is a hydra, the prophet who told him that he was going to be king. Remember? So, so he knew there was a true way and a false way. And the true way is going to lead you past death. The false way is just going to give you comfort here. And that, that's what you have going on here. And so that's why he said to his wife, go, 
you know, and and, and uh, take some loads with you. You know, you you have to pay this guy something in order for him to tell you, uh, so that you will, so that we'll get what we want. Now, verse four, he says Jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. So you shall say thus and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. When Ahijah heard the sound of her feet coming in the doorway, he said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another woman? For I am sent to you with a harsh message. And so here, again, you have a sign that this prophet who she's going to talk to is from God. What's the sign? He knows who, he was. He knows who she is, even though he's blind and she's disguised. He, 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 knew, he knew who she was. So she, so she could count on his, on his message, okay? And he says, Go say to Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, behold, or because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, yet you have not been like my servant David who, who, uh, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast uh, me behind you, behind your back. Therefore, behold, I am bringing calamity on the house of Jeroboam. He says, and will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in, in Israel and will make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs will eat, and he who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens will eat, for the Lord has spoken it. Now you arise, go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child will die. And all Israel will mourn for him and bury him, for he alone of Jeroboam's family will come to the grave, because in him something good was found towards the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Now, I don't have time to get into all of that, but I just wanted to show you what happened as a result. So, so uh, the wife of Jeroboam comes in. And uh, Elijah knows who she is. And so there's the proof that what he's telling her is going to be from God. And basically, uh, Ahijah tells Jeroboam that not only is the child going to die, but all of the men in his family are going to die. In other words, he's going to destroy his line and his lineage. And he's not going to have, he's not going to have a lineage left. And the reason is because God made him leader of the people, but rather than him leading the people in a godly way, how did he lead them? In a sinful way. He built golden images and, and golden calves and, and other places to worship instead of doing what God said. And so therefore, that was going to happen. Now, I want to talk, uh, and I don't have time, but I want to talk about the fact that God said in verse 13 that they will mourn for the child because there was something good found in her. You're going to have to come back next week in order to find that. Let's have a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we're just thankful that you have given us stories that help us realize how important it is and how necessary it is for us to listen to you, to listen to your word, not to listen to what people tell us or preachers tell us or even churches tell us, but to listen to what your word says, Father, because you want to deal with us. You don't want anybody between us and you. So we pray that you help us, Father, to put our trust in you and to follow you and to serve you. We're thankful for your son, Jesus. We pray that you be with all those that we mentioned earlier who were sick and going through difficulties. We pray that you would bless them. We pray, Father, that you would bless the entire world and that people would come to know you through whatever processes you deem necessary. We pray that you bring people to know you because we not only want to live with you, Father, we also want to be able to live with you when we die. We praise you, Father, and thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and we are done.